Hello, and welcome to building applications using Amazon Aurora Serverless, Data API, and Amazon SNS. My name is Vlad Vlaschanu. I am a Principal Database Specialist Solutions Architect at AWS, and I focus on helping customers develop scalable and efficient purpose-built data processing solutions. In this tech talk, I'd like to show you how to work with relational databases using a serverless computing model. I'll focus mainly on Amazon Aurora and the capabilities it offers in this space and show you a working message processing application and demo. At the end, to make things interesting, I will leave you with a challenge to think through. Okay, let's start at the very beginning. Here at AWS, we like to think backwards from our customers. So we thought long and hard about what our customers need to drive success and distilled it down to four core tenets. Agility is first on customers' minds. Our customers want to get to market faster. This means offloading as much undifferentiated work as possible. From infrastructure setup and configuration, all the way down to boilerplate in their own code. Next is cost effectiveness. Paying for resources you consume is a great starting point for customers. But what they really want is a lower overall total cost of ownership for solutions deployed on AWS. Performance and scalability are a given nowadays, but really what we mean here is that customers shouldn't have to re-architect their workloads as they reach various scaling or growth thresholds such as needing an entirely different architecture when they make the jump from a thousand users to a million users. And security is always job number one here at AWS. And customers expect to be able to deploy solutions that are secure and isolated by design. The serverless computing model is uniquely positioned to hit all of these goals, which is why we are seeing tremendous growth in the serverless space. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when mentioning serverless is AWS Lambda, our serverless compute offering, which allows you to design your applications as decoupled functions. Just simply provide your business logic code, and we handle running it and scaling it. This is a powerful model that eliminates a lot of undifferentiated work, managing containers, servers, virtual machines, and so on to support your code. Hundreds of thousands of customers use it, and we see trillions of Lambda invocations per month. Think about that scale. Coca-Cola is a great example of how a serverless strategy enabled agility. When they had to react quickly to the changes brought on by the COVID pandemic, they wanted to provide a touchless experience for their freestyle drink dispensers. And so they built a new smartphone app that allows customers to order and pay for drinks without coming into contact with the vending machines. Because they built with Lambda, their team was able to focus on the application rather than security, latency, scalability, since with Lambda, that's all built in. And as a result, they built this new application in just 100 days and now over 30,000 dispensers have the touchless capability. 
While many customers associate serverless with Lambda, there are actually serverless services at all layers of the solution stack. It's really what all these other components surround Lambda that we start to see much bigger benefits. Messaging, orchestration, data stores, and compute together are the secret sauce. And you have the flexibility to pick from a variety of choices in each of these categories to use the right service for your particular use case. That said, in the past, traditional relational databases have been harder to scale and integrate into serverless workflows for a variety of reasons. I'll touch upon some of these throughout this tech talk. We aimed to change that when we introduced Amazon Aurora several years ago. The reason we developed Aurora is because our customers asked us for a cloud native database with enterprise grade features at open source prices, fully managed just like many of our other services. As a result, Aurora is designed from the ground up to provide performance and availability on par or better than commercial databases at the cost effectiveness of open source databases. Better yet, Aurora is drop-in protocol compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL databases. This certainly helps when you need to adopt it coming from MySQL or PostgreSQL, because you may not even need to make any code changes at all in your applications to adopt it. But it also helps because developers, DBAs, and other operators can leverage the large amount of MySQL and PostgreSQL knowledge available online to port their skills over easily. And all of these capabilities are delivered using a consumption-based pricing model, just like most other AWS services. So why is Aurora different? Well, the first major innovation we introduced was, the, was to overcome the tight coupling between storage and query processing that exists in traditional databases today and that is a big scaling choke point. In, for Aurora, we developed from the ground up a purpose-built, log-structured, distributed storage service. There is actually a SIGMOD research paper. You can read about it. The log is the database. We never write full data pages or blocks to storage. This reduces the volume of I.O. generated by the database. The Aurora storage volume for any given database grows and shrinks with the data automatically and is striped over tens or even hundreds of storage nodes, depending on size, always storing six copies of your data two in each of three availability zones in a given region. This allows us to protect your data from an entire AZ failure, plus an additional storage node failure for each stripe at any given point in time. On top of that, data is continuously and automatically streamed to Amazon S3 for backup and point-in-time recovery purposes, with no impact to database operations. Now, initially, we offered Aurora in what we call provisioned mode. This means on top of this scalable storage layer, you provision discrete compute capacity. You can have a cluster with up to 16 database instances, all reading from the same storage volume. 
One of those instances always has to be a writer. The diagram you see on screen only shows a cluster with one writer and two readers. But what if the Aurora database compute capacity can scale seamlessly too? This brings us to the next big innovation in Aurora. Database engines are a highly complex state machine, which is why they are so hard to scale. Nevertheless, having an automatically scalable compute layer enables or optimizes a whole host of use cases. Serverless workloads, software as a service workloads with single tenant data stores, workloads with high load variability or infrequent load, cost-effective dev and test, just to name a few. We're essentially solving the capacity management problem. If you only have access to provisioned compute capacity for relational databases, you either provision for peak, which is expensive, or you don't and risk brownouts, or you build complex automation to scale up and down, which is hard and involves downtime. This forces you to make a trade-off between cost and management burden. With Aurora Serverless V1, you no longer have to make those types of trade-offs. So here's how it works. Your application still talks to a MySQL or PostgreSQL compatible endpoint. Only it doesn't talk directly to the database engine. Instead, it connects to a lightweight and highly available request router service in charge of managing connections and routing traffic. Behind this router is a single tenant database instance handling database operations. The full database engine and compute capacity is dedicated to your workload. Data is still kept durable and highly available on the same type of storage volume as I described previously. We also maintain a warm pool of compute capacity, which are database instances of different sizes. When our control plane detects that scaling thresholds are reached, which is typically a combination of CPU load and concurrent connections, it takes action to scale your compute capacity. Now, the thresholds are not under your control. Instead, we iterate over time and fine tune them by applying past learnings to continuously improve scaling of your Aurora clusters. So here's what that means in practice. Depending on scaling need, we take a bigger or smaller instance out of the warm pool, configure it to access your storage volume, synchronize the page cache with the existing one. So you start with a hot cache and then find a scaling point between two transactions and swap the existing instance out. This operation is coordinated with the router service, which will hold application connections open, queue up an incoming work until the swap completes, and then it will release the queued up work to the new compute instance. Scaling operations don't disrupt connections, although you may observe a two to three second response latency during that swap out. With this model, you control the minimum and maximum capacity to scale between, as well as whether the compute capacity should be paused completely after a certain amount of time without any activity for further cost savings. Capacity is expressed in ACUs, Aurora Capacity Units, which represent about two gigabytes of memory plus corresponding CPU and network capacity. Think of one ACU equivalent to the smallest database instance size we offer for Aurora. And you pay for the number of ACU hours consumed, billed at a per second granularity. Now you have probably noticed 
there's a single database instance serving your cluster at any given point in time. So what happens if it fails? In most failure scenarios, we simply get a new compute instance out of the warm pool and get you up and running in a few seconds. But it is possible, though unlikely, that the warm pool could be temporarily exhausted. And in that case, we have to provision a compute instance from scratch. So your failure recovery in the worst case can be several minutes. Aurora Serverless appeals strongly to customers that want to simplify their architectures and have highly available load patterns, such as our good friends at CoreStorm, who operate SaaS products catering to the education and workforce development markets. Their course registration solution has irregular usage patterns, and our raw serverless help them reduce a lot of database maintenance and administration work while providing quick and easy scaling. Now, you probably heard me referencing serverless v1 before. And that's because we keep innovating in this space and already have announced serverless version two. In fact, this technology is available already in preview for MySQL and will be generally available soon for both MySQL and PostgreSQL compatible Aurora. With V2, we hope to take capacity scaling a big step further providing capacity scaling in a fraction of a second with much finer granularity to deliver just the right, right amount of capacity to your workload. In turn, this will result in even better cost savings. And you will have access to the full breadth of Aurora capabilities, including global database, multi-AZ, and so on. The big difference with V2 is that we operate a large and scalable fleet of compute capacity supported by advanced heat management algorithms. As a result, the compute capacity your Aurora serverless cluster consumes can be scaled up or down in place in milliseconds. And because of that, scaling can also occur in finer grained capacity adjustments half an ACU versus doubling ACUs with version one. Our heat management algorithms would then seamlessly redistribute load over the compute fleet to ensure there is enough hardware capacity available for each customer to scale when needed. This enables customers with serverless workloads sharded databases or multi-tenant workloads to lean on capabilities we provide out of the box to get operational and cost efficiencies at any given point in time. But there is one more feature tying the serverless relational database offering together, so to speak. It is the RDS Data API service. With Aurora Serverless alone, you still have to speak over the MySQL or PostgreSQL protocol. And these clusters are still attached to a VPC, which is a private isolated network construct, even if the compute capacity is scalable. But serverless apps have a different interaction model. They are typically functions with limited resources with short-lived execution times that are usually not bound to VPCs. Packaging heavy MySQL or PostgreSQL client libraries into the functions and having many short-lived database connections against the database are often undesirable as well. RDS Data API provides an HTTPS-based endpoint where you can issue queries, which in turn are sent to the database over a connection pool. 
your function can make a RESTful call, just like calling any other AWS API with IAM-based authentication and SIGV4 request signing for security. And the data API in turn will speak to the database over a connection pool using the native protocol and fetch the responses back from the database. Now, to be clear, the data API isn't meant to support the full range of possible SQL interactions you can have over a native MySQL or PostgreSQL client. For instance, you do have a limit of one megabyte response size. Instead, it is optimized for what Lambda functions are best at, such as processing small, discrete amounts of data or RESTful patterns without the overhead of establishing connections and complex session contexts. Okay, I think it's time to build a serverless application. I'm going to show you a simple application that monitors wait times to get your vaccines here in the US in near real time. By wait times, I mean how long you have to wait for the time you from the time you show up until you get a shot in your arm. By the way, the data represented is totally artificial. So no patient or personal information is used in this demo. I mentioned at the beginning that serverless is more than Lambda compute functions. You typically also need integration services. And I have chosen Amazon SNS because you can build very easily message bus type applications that are scalable using easy to use primitives. Simply put, SNS delivers messages from publishers to subscribers. You create topics and subscribe consumers to those topics. These consumers can be other services, Lambda functions, custom HTTPS endpoints, queues, and more. Or they can be personal endpoints, mobile push notifications, text messaging, emails. And SNS integrates well with other AWS services for publication too such as CloudWatch alarms can publish to SNS topics, RDS events can publish to SNS topics as well. And SNS has advanced features like first in, first out topics that deduplicate and order messages or retry policies, dead letter queues, subscription filters, encryption of messages at rest, and many, many more capabilities. So here is the big architecture picture of our app. We have clinic staff capture patient check-in and vaccine administration times. Their terminals send those messages to SNS. Lambda persists that data in the databases using the data API. And another workflow pulls aggregate statistics from the database using Lambda and the data API or website consumption. And users access the website hosted via CloudFront and Amazon S3. And in case you were wondering, all of these services are HIPAA eligible, suitable for processing and storing personal health information. So they are great at supporting our use case. Going a bit more into details of the ingest and message bus data flow, messages are published to an SNS topic. Now, in our demo case, the clinic staff doesn't actually exist. I simply have a load generator script that produces that data. A Lambda function is subscribed to the SNS topic receives the message and inserts the data into the database via data API. You can see the relevant code snippet on the slide. I'm using Python 
in the Python AWS SDK, BOTO3, which abstracts the RESTful API call to Data API. Now, of note here is that you do need to provide database credentials to Data API. And you do so by providing the resource identifier of an AWS Secrets Manager secret, which contains the actual database credentials. Secrets Manager, as the name implies, allows you to securely store secrets and delegate access to them to other services. In our case, Lambda has an execution IAM policy attached, defining what AWS resources the function is allowed to access. This function is allowed to access the secret and the RDS data API. When invoking the data API, the function passes the authorization to access the secret to the data API on its behalf. Now, for the reporting data flow, we also use a Lambda function that queries the database over the data API. Only this time, we use another AWS service called EventBridge to set up a rule that triggers the function on a schedule every minute, kind of like a cron job. EventBridge has many other great capabilities that are, however, beyond the scope of this tech talk to discuss. This Lambda function receives the necessary data from the data API and then writes the results as a JSON object in a designated Amazon S3 bucket. And finally, end users would access our website using CloudFront. And then CloudFront would fetch the data set stored in S3 to show the browser visualization. We chose CloudFront because it integrates very well with S3. S3 hosts our website assets, and CloudFront, our content delivery network, can easily access and distribute them to end users upon request and do so very efficiently. OK, finally, let's see the demo. So. Here's what the end user sees. This is just a simple visualization of average wait times across US states. Like I said before, this is artificial data with some biases deliberately introduced. And I've accelerated the sampling so you can see differences in real time with ref refreshes every minute or so. Now, if you uh, if you looked on screen, you probably already saw one of those refreshes. We can wait another minute and see how it refreshes automatically again. In the meantime, we can look at the data and we can potentially see that right now the highest wait times are in Vermont, which 66 minutes on average, and the lowest wait times are, I believe, in Idaho with eight minutes of wait time. We can give it a little bit more time to refresh. So this website does nothing other than just displaying a chart and essentially issuing a, a request to the server to get download the new data set. And you can see it has refreshed in the meantime. Uh, we no longer have data for Idaho. But right now, the busiest state seems to be Minnesota with 51 minutes of average wait time. And Alabama is the um, you can get your vaccine fastest, only waiting about 15 minutes to get it. OK, so now that we can see that the data changes in real time, I also have my load generator with a lot, relatively low number of threads, eight in this case. But let's take a look at the load generator script. So here it is, and you can see that I'm generating about, 100, about 160 to 200 messages per second. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this script. When it will increase 
the volume of messages higher by simply changing the number of threads. All right. So I've started it with a higher number of threads. The load generator is really simple. It connects to the database, selects a random clinic, inserts a few records, and then repeats the cycle. Now, because I'm getting diminishing returns the more threads I add, let's use a second load generator to send more load from it. I'm going to go ahead and copy this command that I have up here and run it over my second load generator that's here waiting. And let's see, it's starting. It'll take a few seconds and then go ahead, it starts actually ramping up the rate of messages. So we're generating about 400 messages per second over each one of these threads. Now, while we wait a few minutes to see the impact, let me show you these resources in the AWS console. So this is my AWS console. And I'm going to navigate to the AWS Lambda Service Console. You can click it here out of my, the list of re recent services I visited. And you see the two functions I'm using in this solution. One consumes from SNS, the one here at the bottom, topic, cons topic consumer. And the other runs the reporting query, then named get reports. When I click on the function, the console produces a neat visualization of the integration points for this function. In this case, you can see SNS as the trigger for my function. You can easily con control the configuration of the function, how much memory and how what the timeout value is, as well as any number of other parameters, including environment variables and permissions. And you can edit the code itself directly from the console. Scrolling down here and selecting my code file. And you can see the same snippet of code here that I showed on the slide earlier, showing how the data gets inserted into the database. And you can monitor the function from this interface as well. I'm going to switch over to my monitoring tab. And it takes a few seconds for the CloudWatch metrics to load. Now we should be able to see the variability and the invocation rate. So this is, you can see a spike in the number of function invocations as my, as I've ramped up my load generator script, because now there's more messages to be consumed. Okay, so let's switch views to the serverless cluster. So I'm gonna go to the RDS console here at the top, choose that from my, list of services. And we can see, go to databases and select our serverless cluster. Now you can easily control the configuration of this cluster by simply clicking modify here. And if I do so, um, I can uh, control the configuration of my cluster. You can see uh, that I can set and update the capacity boundaries of my cluster. Right now, the cluster is allowed to scale between one capacity unit and eight capacity units. This, num this number can be as high as 256 capacity units corresponding to roughly about 488 gigabytes of RAM. And I can easily enable or disable the data API with a simple checkbox. There's no complex configuration required. I'm not gonna save any of these changes. I'm gonna exit out of the screen. 
I wanted to go and show you the monitoring tab. So I can monitor my cluster directly from this console here. And one thing you'll see is that my capacity has actually been scaling as we've added loads to the cluster. So there was no utilization earlier today. Um, then some, uh, while I we were having this discussion today, I was actually generating a little bit of load against the database. So we were consuming about two capacity units. And then it suddenly spiked up to four capacity units when I sent even more load to the database. You can see equivalent metrics in terms of CPU, database connections to correspond to some of those uh, changes. Now, I have also created a CloudWatch dashboard. So I can get a single pane of glass of my most important metrics for this solution. So I'm going to go to the CloudWatch service console. And when I search for this, I am it's already hinting at the top features here. So I can click directly on dashboards. That will take me to that particular feature of CloudWatch. And I can choose the dashboard for this particular tech talk that I set up for this application, where I can see all of my metrics all on a single screen. So we can see the capacity units. We can see how it's scaling. We can see database connection, CPU utilization, my load generators, the number of messages that were being produced, DB information in terms of latency and throughput. So all of this is available from a single um, monitoring dashboard. And you can see how LAM, uh, raw serverless scales seamlessly automatically on your behalf as you're uh, increasing the load or correspondingly also when you're decreasing the load. All right, going back to my uh, website, right, my actual end, what my end users are seeing, you can see that the data continues to be updated, right? and the uh, wait times change over time. Now, this data set is obviously accelerated just to illustrate the capability. Okay, so as we're coming to an end of this webinar, I want to leave you with a challenge. Currently, our solution is designed for simplicity and scalability. In fact, the database is not used anywhere in the critical path of end users. We can easily scale to thousands of messages per second, which is enough for this particular use case. At a rate of 1,000 vaccines per second, we'd have the entire US population vaccinated in less than four days. Wouldn't that be easy? But there is always room for improvement. Just think about it. How would you improve it? Well, here are some of my ideas. We can subscribe an SQS queue to the SNS topic and buffer the inserts into the database by consuming from the queue, not from SNS directly. This can help us scale more if needed. Or consider using a data streaming solution like Kinesis Data Streams to scale the rate of ingest even higher if our workload requires it. This would also batch the data inserts into the database. Or my personal favorite, why insert individual records in the database in the first place? We could use Kinesis data analytics to compute aggregates on the real-time data stream and only store those in the database. Since the individual vaccine records are still valuable, we can simply write them into S3 and maybe query them ad hoc later when needed with Amazon Athena. Can you think of other improvements or solutions? To the same problem? 
Before we go, if there's anything important to remember from this tech talk, it's probably this. Consider Aurora serverless if you need relational database capabilities in your serverless solution. Data API really provides that final piece of the puzzle in terms of accessing Aurora serverless from short-lived functions. And finally, AWS provides a wide array of cloud-native event and message processing capabilities. They each have different features and can address different simplicity, scaling, agility, and cost requirements. Thank you very much for attending this Tech Talk. It was a pleasure spending this time with you. And please reach out if there is any way we can help you in your AWS journey. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now.